Hi folks, my name is Gil Hova, and I'm here to talk to you about the well-integrated theme. Uh, we are going to look at how we can try to merge theme and mechanism together in board games. Uh, now, quick note about me, like if you don't know uh, who I am, uh, I am a board game designer. Uh, I'm starting to jump into the world of role-playing game design also, TTT, T there's two T's, TTRPG role-playing games. Um, so tabletop in general is where I try to live. Um, I co-host a podcast called Ludology, and uh, and you might know me from board games like The Networks, High Rise, Wordsy, Bad Medicine, and so on. Um, now, uh, I, uh, I've got two quick uh, notes before we start. The first is I have this, uh, this ear thing that I'm on medication for, so I might get a little loopy uh, during this talk. Uh, because um, I'm a little bit out of it. So if I seem a little out of sorts or distracted, that's why. Um, and the second thing is I'm afraid we're actually not going to be talking about the well-integrated theme today. Um, sorry if you're getting your hopes up, but instead I'm going to tell you about this game that I came up with. It's just now, you know, I just started sketching it out and it's going to be awesome because it's going to be so thematic. It's going to be so immersive. It's going to be amazing. So here's the idea. This is going to be like a minis-based space station defense game. So one player is going to play the marauding chaotic space zebras. Now that's zebras with an X. So the other player plays a species of sentient space pudding. The two sides are battling it out over a space station, and the player who gets control over the space station wins the game. Now, this pitch alone is going to sell a million copies, and it's going to make me an overnight household name. I'm going to be on Conan. Uh, I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, the whole thing. It's going to be incredible. Um, so here's how the game plays. So we're going to represent the space station as a grid. Now, this is, of course, pre-art, you know, pre-graphic design, just my sketch. Uh, so the zebras are spelled with an X. So, of course, we're going to represent them with an X. Super thematic, right? X for zebras. Uh, now uh, we're going to move on to the sentient space pudding. They're going to have really cool flying saucer minis, but for now we're just going to mark them as an O. So there are our sentient space pudding. All right, let's talk about we, what we just saw, because uh, I'm sure you've had play tests of a game that just wasn't what it promised to be. Um, a game is far more than its theme, and a game is far more than its mechanism. Uh, we just proved that. Uh, we had this game that promised us an amazing interstellar battle, and we got tic-tac-toe. So uh, that is what my talk is going to be about. Uh, it's going to be about this phenomenon, about integrating theme and mechanism, where something could seem super thematic coming in from uh, the designer's perspective, but it just isn't right from the player's perspective. And we're going to try to reconcile those views and try to get uh, th that join as tight as possible. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is ludonarrative dissonance, okay? Uh, that's the game design term for uh, what we just saw. Uh, in this case, the theme and the mechanism just are not getting along. They're not quite contradicting each other, but they're not working in tandem. Um, now, ludonarrative dissonance is not an inherently bad thing. Uh, just because a game has ludonarrative dissonance doesn't make it bad. Um, just like in music, you can use dissonance, and it actually sounds really cool. Some games use ludonarrative dissonance for their advantage. I think in the video game space, a great example of this is Typing of the Dead. Uh, that game is about typing as fast as you can to kill zombies. Uh, that's dissonant, but it's intentionally dissonant. That's the whole charm of the game, is this weird cross-section of the two. Another one is um, Mike Selniker's word game, Unspeakable Words, which is a word game with a Cthulhu theme. Uh, and again, that's extremely dissonant because it's supposed to be. Uh, and it works because of that dissonance. The whole appeal of the game is the dissonance. But in both cases, they leaned into the dissonance. The dissonance is what uh, sold the game. Um, and yes, Melissa, the minis are going to be amazing. Uh, so let's look at a couple of case studies. Now, let me start with a disclaimer. None of the things I'm going to tell you are universal. They're all rules of thumb. You can break these rules but you'll increase your chances of success just by knowing them before you break them. And the second thing I'm going to mention is we're going to talk mostly about board games in this talk. Uh, RPGs uh, are a different ball of wax. Um, I think a lot of this talk really is going to focus on uh, the experience of designing a board game. So let's talk about some case studies. Uh, the first one is this game called Monkeys on the Moon. I really like this game. I think this game is, is really fun and really interesting. Um, but it suffers from dissonance problems that were not intended, 
and that I feel got in the way of it becoming um, a more widely known game than it was. Um, so this game came out in the mid aughts, you know, back when before Kickstarter, when you could uh, have sort of subpar components in your game. This one had these little wooden buttons to represent coins, uh, which I think nowadays you wouldn't be able to get away with. Like every nowadays, everything's got to be Kickstarter beautiful. Uh, so the idea of Monkeys on the Moon is you uh, are trying to civilize uh, one, a, a bunch of monkeys that are formed in six tribes on the moon. And the way they're arranged, each tribe of monkeys has two allies and an enemy. So as you civilize a tribe of monkeys, uh, you also appease their allies, but you anger their enemies. Uh, so there's this bidding system to handle that. Then uh, there's a row of individual monkeys who belong to the different tribes. You're going to try to bid for the most civilized monkey among them and shoot them back to Earth. Now, that is a wild theme. It's just off the wall. And um, it's really funny, it's really clever, and it's really inventive. And mechanically, this game is a dry bidding euro. I honestly think that if this game had been set as a trading in the Mediterranean game, like a literal trading in the Mediterranean game, it would have done better. Because you would have heard the theme, you would have played the, the game and experienced the mechanisms, and it would have fallen into each other. They, they would have dovetailed. In this one, they are not dovetailing. They're fighting each other. And I think that's an example of, um, of unintended looted narrative dissonance that wound up harming a game. I thought was a really good game regardless. Um, let me show you another example. Uh, this is a Reiner Kinesi game uh, called Jäger und Sammler. Sorry for my horrible German. Um, so this it actually came from a prototype that Kinesia signed with two different publishers. Uh, one of them was Amigo, who took this game took the prototype and made it about this um, sort of a movement game that's set in the Stone Age uh, or thereabouts uh, where you're hunters and gatherers. That's literally what the title of the game is, Hunters and Gatherers, and you're trying to gather food. It's a little bit like, hey, that's my fish, if you've ever played that. Um, so as you can see, 10 and up on, um, on the age scale, it's really approachable. It's a lovely Euro. Now, I mentioned there were two publishers that took this on. Another one was Twilight Creations, and I've met some people at Twilight. They're awesome. Uh, they're a really cool company. Uh, they generally make games about zombies. And this is the game that they turned the same prototype that uh, was uh, Jaeger and Sammler also became Zombie Geddon, with a couple of small rules tweaks to make the game a little bit more competitive. Now, I'm just going to jump back and forth to reinforce the idea that these two came from the same prototype. Um, now, um, this is another example of, um, of how a game and its theme may not always be a tight joint, and people sometimes talk about pasted on themes. And I think this is an example of when people can talk about that, when the same game has a gentle, relatively gentle hunter and gatherer theme and this uh, incredibly intense zombie game, and they have roughly the same play. There's a lot of overlap in how they play. Uh, I think that's a sign uh, that the theme and the mechanism just wasn't, uh, a, there wasn't really a priority to push those together uh, and make those work with each other. And th these two games came out uh, like maybe 15 years ago. Um, I don't think you get a, could get away with it now. I think the audiences are far more discerning. And again, this part of what we're talking about is combining this theme and mechanism. Now, um, I'm going to talk about a model that I've discussed before. Um, I call it uh, player in three persons. Um, and uh, I uh, used a lot of uh, concepts from, from an excellent online essay called Crimes Against Mimesis, uh, M-E-M-E-S-I-S. Uh, which uh, you can find online with a quick Google search. You might uh, have to find a PDF of it. But uh, uh, Crimes Against Mimesis uh, had uh, the base of this idea, which are kind of fleshed out uh, for a player in three persons. So there's really three people, um, or uh, yeah, three people that you're really designing for when you're making a board game. Um, the first is the player. Now, this is the flesh and blood player who's sitting at the table, like they're eating Cheetos, they're drinking Red Bull, and hopefully they're having a good time. What are their stakes? Like, what do they want from the game? Maybe they want to prove how good they are. Maybe they want to get lost in the math of the game. Maybe they want to explore a weird strategy. Maybe they want to get to know the other players better. Maybe they want to get better at the game. 
But let's start here with the actual physical player. That's the first person uh, is the player. Uh, second is what I call the avatar. This is the character that the player is manipulating on a story level. In Arkham Horror, uh, you are investigators trying to close a portal. In Pandemic, you are medical professionals trying to save humanity from a terrible virus outbreak. In Munchkin, you're dungeon adventurers trying to level up. Now, not every game has a really clearly defined avatar. Uh, games like Catan, Flux, Ticket to Ride, they all have very vague avatars. The more vague the avatar is, the more dry or abstract the game will feel. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, because it depends on the third person, which is the agent. Okay? The agent is the player's mechanical representation of the game, in the game. Um, in Arkham Horror, uh, your agents are trying to build up enough mechanical power to roll well enough to defeat a final uh, boss. In Pandemic, your agents are trying to get enough cards of the correct color in hand to gain a VP, and you win at 4 VP. And in Munchkins, you're trying to, get, you're trying to score 10 VP. The agent is completely mechanical. Some players only ever, about, only ever care about playing games as agents. Um, they're the ones, when they play a game, theme just falls away. Um, now, other people like taking game from the avatar's point of view. They like to role play, but the agent, you know those players, you know, within two or three rounds, they're, they're not saying, give me a wheat or give me a wood. They're saying, give me a yellow cube, give me a brown cube, because the theme is just gone for them. And they're focused on the mechanisms, the levers and pulleys uh, through which they can perform well in the game. Um, this is an important context here, important perspective here, especially in the context of a strategy board game. Uh, so these three relate uh, in a way that I think is pretty meaningful. Uh, because if we look at the joins between these three people, uh, I think we find some interesting stuff. So if the join between the player and the avatar is strong, the game's going to feel immersive. Uh, this is the trick of video games, escape rooms, and LARP. They're going to try to smush the player and the avatar together and try to get that join as tight as possible. Um, I think uh, another example of this is the board game Nyctophobia, uh, where uh, you are uh, trying to escape from a cold-blooded killer, uh, like a horror movie killer, like a Jason type, um, and you literally are not allowed to see. You are blindfolded. Uh, and that's a way that you're um, sort of put in this position of the avatar. Uh, and not a lot of board games do it that viscerally. Uh, now, let's look at the uh, connection. Let's look at the join between the avatar and the agent. Now, if that join between the avatar and agent is strong, then the game's going to feel thematic. Um, one game I really like is The Pursuit of Happiness, um, where it's one of those quote-unquote life simulators where your character has less time and more money when they get a job. Now, that's just adjusting two pieces of currency, but because one uh, currency is time and another currency is, is money, um, and time has temporal implications, like the less time you have, the less you can do in the game, um, it feels right, like it feels thematic. And uh, that's an example of things having names that they mechanically correspond well to. And that represents a really strong avatar agent join. Now, if the join between the player and the agent is strong, then the game is elegant. In other words, the player can see right through the game and know exactly what they need to do well. Uh, and that's an elegant game. Like, they may not know what the right move is, but they know what their moves are, and it's just a question of which the right one is. And that's really, a lot of times in a strategy game, that's where you want your players to be. They're not trying to figure out, what can I do on my move? They're trying to figure out, what should I do on my move? And the more elegant the game is, the more likely you can get them in that headspace. Uh, and that refers to a strong player-agent joint. So, uh, now uh, that we've gone through uh, this model, uh, let's talk about how we can create a game with a well-integrated theme. Uh, so, I'm going to go through a few tips. And the first tip is... Um, as full an overlap as you can get between an avatar and agent, okay? Uh, the other two joints are useful, as I've mentioned, but I think this one is really, really useful. Uh, everybody has their own way of doing it. Uh, personally, the way I like to do it is I generally don't play test a game until I feel like this join is as strong as possible. Like, uh, the I, when I feel like um, I'm talking the same language when I'm manipulating theme or mechanism, I feel when they're doing the same thing, I feel like that's the time when I can start taking the game from notes on a piece of paper to uh, the uh, to, to an actual prototype. Um, until then, I try to continue writing things down until I find that join. But I think that join is my turning point. And 
I think that's such a critical spot to begin. That's almost like the navel of my game. Like, that's where the game starts for me. Um, and that's sort of the origin. That's the home. Everything's going to radiate out of that joint. Uh, now, of course, this isn't going to be possible with every game. Like, for example, I have a game called Wordsy. It's a word game. There isn't much of an avatar in Wordsy because there's no theme to it other than, or I should say, there's no story to it other than it's a word game, you know? Uh, or is there? We'll talk about moment but there's a level the avatar level of the story is just not there you know you're not telling a story in the world of the game but there are some other stories that you're telling and we're going to get to that in a moment now let's get back to that really awful tic-tac-toe space station game i mentioned before um so uh our avatar in that game wanted epic space battles they wanted laser beams they wanted star fighters they wanted explosions our agent wanted to line up three symbols in a row and as you can see, those don't match up at all. Like, there's, no, there's nothing connecting those two activities. Uh, blowing up space, the spaceships versus getting three in a row. Uh, so what happened in Monkeys on a Moon? Our avatar is zany and loony. Uh, you've got this uh, very silly theme of monkeys uh, trying to get civilized. Uh, whereas our agent is very dry and buttoned up because it's there's an auction, there's bidding, there's valuation. There's nothing really silly or zany about the mechanisms to the game. So once again, those just don't connect. Zombie Geddon uh, has the same agent as Jaeger and Samler, but to a totally different avatar. Uh, and that makes the join loose for both of those games. Uh, so I, that's an illustration of how, how I think the player three persons model can help us understand the join of a uh, theme and mechanism in a game. So uh, I'm going to uh, go to a point where uh, I want you in the chat uh, to respond to me at this point, because I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you folks to reply in chat. Uh, we're going to do this little exercise, and I've done this exercise before. I really like this exercise as a way of showing what you're doing when you're giving a game a theme. So uh, let's say that uh, um, we're doing a game about pirates, okay? Um, so we're making a game about pirates. So let's start with the resources. Uh, type in the chat what resources you think a game about pirates is going to have. So uh, just go ahead and type uh, doubloons. That's that would probably be our mode of money. Gold coins, uh, ships, crew members, morale. Uh, those are all good. I don't know if mayhem is, would necessarily be a real resource. Hideouts. That'd certainly be a part of it. Um, what about rum? Would rum work in the game? Treachery, badassery. Yes, those are characteristics. I'm talking about things you'd you'd spend. Uh, but like doubloons is one. Um, I I generally see rum in these games because uh, pirates will drink rum. Uh, uh, Andy, you mentioned wind. Uh, wind works. Information in the form of treasure maps. Uh, rum or grog? Absolutely. Now I'm going to ask another question. Um, would you want combat in this game? It's a pirate game. Do you want combat in this game? Wooden legs of pirates. Absolutely. It fits, says, is one reply. Yeah, uh, combat makes sense. Yep, so uh, com com competing pirates, sure, violence. Absolutely, yeah. Generally, people see a game about pirates and they say, uh, okay, there's probably going to be combat in it. Would you want an auction in this game? Do you think an auction fits in this game? So uh, if this game has an auction... If I sit down to play a pirate game and then I say, okay, now we're going to do a bid. Uh, okay, very violent auction. Uh, not sure about PvP combat. Uh, that's fair. Uh, yes to combat. Uh, swashbuckling, ship combat. Uh, selling ships, competing over territory um, as auctions, maybe. But we can see that it's... Uh, oh, what are, which uh, pirate... Uh, Game is that, uh, Ozarkal, your favorite pirate game is an auction mechanism. Um, uh, and I don't think an auction is quite right. Uh, you can make an auction work, but it doesn't seem uh, as intuitive. Uh, auction seems like it could work, but the connection is less clear. So you see, like, once you get to an auction, you're on shakier ground. I'm not saying you can't do it, 
But you see right away, if you have a choice between like combat or auction, not that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, but you can see how one of those mechanisms seems to fit right in. And the other mechanism might be a bit of work, might be a bit of labor to pull that off. Now, what do you want movement in a pirate game? Does movement make sense? Piracy and pushing your luck go hand in hand, absolutely. Uh, so would you want movement in a pirate game? Like, would you have figures on the board that would move from one area to a board? Oh, please, movement, yes. Wind, tides, navigation. Um, uh, threats and intimidation would make more sense as auction as an indirect conflict. Ships sailing, treasure maps, mutiny. Uh, yes, it has an auction mechanism about private crewmates. That's cool. That's but you see how that that auction is uh, pushed into the theme because it's about bribing crewmates. Like they they did the work to make it pull off. They didn't just say, okay, here's an auction for the right to uh, to get money or to land on this island. You were trying to bribe your crewmates, and that auction makes a little more sense. Uh, movement, boat sailing, people climbing the rigging, the mast, etc. Yes. Um, now, one thing that's interesting, somebody mentioned wind. Um, that implies that we don't have full control over our movement. Like, we have partial control. Like, if there's no wind, we're probably not going anywhere. So this is a game where combat, we're sorry, where movement is probably going to be handled with a die roll instead of just being like, you can move three or four spaces per turn. Um, so uh, you see how we all we started with was a theme, and already the theme is giving us walls in which we can place our mechanism. Now, I'm not saying that we can't have an auction. I'm not saying we can't have perfect movement or things like that. I'm just saying that if you do those things, you're it's going against the, against the wind, to borrow a phrase. Uh, you are going to have tougher sailing. I can't break this aquatic uh, theme, uh, this aquatic metaphor. The, the, the important thing is the game is sort of implying that there's a series of mechanisms that work well within that theme. And if you stay within those, um, you're going to come up with a much more thematic game than if you start with a mechanism and try to shoehorn it into the theme without really thinking about it and considering how it works. Uh, could be an interesting game about in equipping your pirate ship, hiring crew with no movement. Absolutely. Like I say, uh, none of what I'm saying are like objective. You must do this. You cannot do that. But what I'm saying is there are things that will make your job easier. Yeah, definitely leaning into that metaphor. Um, and uh, do you think that if we made a pirate game that was a roll and write with absolutely no interaction, one of those that scale to as many players as possible, do you think that would work with a pirate theme? Do you think the pirate theme would really come through with a game like that? Asking the chat uh, about uh, roll and write, a uh, low interaction or even no interaction roll and write uh, that has a pirate theme. What do you think about that if you sit down to play a game with a pirate theme and it turns out to be a low interaction roll and write or a no interaction roll and write? Uh, there's a no, not in my mind. Any other thoughts about that? So uh, I'm just going to go with that. It needs the direct conflict. Yeah. It needs, or at least some kind of player interaction. Because once you hear, it uh, sounds more boring than piracy. Pirates need to interact. Yeah, there needs to be some kind of interaction. If you promise pirates, you want inter you're promising interaction. And if you wind up doing a low interaction game, I think that's going to change uh, the way it plays. If you're managing the conflict from afar, maybe. But then it might not feel like pirates. Because if you're making it about pirates, I think people are expecting the swashbuckling. And they're expecting to climb the rigging and to board the other ship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, unless you can it in other players, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to another example. Let's say instead of them making a game about pirates, insurance underwriting of piracy. Now there's a theme. Um, and we're going to get to insurance underwriting. I, I, I'm going to come back to insurance underwriting of piracy because I think that's the, there's a really solid example in there. I think that's really cool. Uh, so let's go to another theme. Um, uh, let's talk about building a castle. This is a very common theme in Euro games. Uh, there's some grumpy monarch out there who wants a castle built, and you're going to build a castle for him. Uh, so let's start again with the uh, with the resources. Uh, what sorts of resources would players be collecting for a castle for for uh, building a castle game? Uh, let's uh, let's see uh, what you folks think. Uh, resources for a castle building game. Serfs, okay. Um, that's possible. 
skilled architects. I'm talking about resources, stone, lumber, port portable, potable water, absolutely, drinkable water, uh, all those things, stone, lumber, clay, brick, you know, these are like standard Euro resources. Uh, people as resources, a lot of Euros do that. Gold, loans from other lo um, lords, loans from other lords. I told you my medication is messing my head up. Uh, land, animals, a sheep or a pig will work well in a game like this? Absolutely. Um, now, uh, would you want combat in this game? Do you think combat is a natural fit in a game like that? Like, do you think you can attack another player and destroy all the parts of the castle that they've built so far? Uh, do you think combat like that, like direct interaction, do you think it would work in a game like this? Um, I'm not saying absolutely yes or no. I'm just saying, uh, do you think it would be easier or harder to pull off, uh, knowing that we're making a game with like a bored looking king on the cover? Uh, for building a castle, maybe not. Uh, okay, uh, any other thoughts? Uh, just want to get like more uh, thoughts. Definitely harder. Uh, maybe not combat, but competition. Uh, uh, the best bid, uh, maybe it's a neutral hazard. But you see, like, we're all saying uh, combat as, um, uh, as, like, an integral mechanism in this game is going to be a much harder lift than it would be for the pirate game. For the pirate game, combat was just a natural fit. For this game, uh, combat is going to be a lot harder to pull off. I'm not saying you can't do combat. I'm saying you're going to have to really work to make it, make, uh, make it work. Uh, so an auction, do you think an auction would fit in a game like this? Uh, if we had an auction for resources, and the player who won those resources could put those uh, resources using some conversion into the um, into the castle, or maybe you're auctioning, you're bidding for the best possible conversion to put into the castle. Do you think that would work? Yes to auction. Uh, we all compete to be the best pirate castle. Oh, definitely. You can use combat indirectly to steal resources. Um, <laughs> Melissa is very combative today, apparently. <laughs> um, but yes, you see how in this game, it's the opposite of the last one. In the pirate game, um, the auction was a tougher lift, but combat was a natural. In this one, the auction is a very natural uh, fit, but combat is much tougher. And all we're doing is we're changing the theme. That's the only parameter. We just went from pirate's castle, two different one-word themes, and now we've, it's telling us we need to make two totally different games. Um, so, uh, another thing about this theme is the theme is much looser, you know, because it's not promising as much. Pirates promises a very specific experience. Building a castle doesn't promise an experience that on a, a gentle, le I'm sorry, on uh, an avatar level, it doesn't promise a meaty story the way a pirate theme does. Uh, so we can really explore the agential side a lot more. And that's like the knack of a lot of board games. That's the trick that a lot of Euro games uh, really have. Um, and finally, would you want to make would you want to make or play a roll and write with a building a castle theme um, uh, with zero interaction, like a no interaction game about building a castle? Does that make sense to you? Would you play? Um, yes, Ryan, I'm taking notes for my next three Kickstarters. I'm having my ferrets uh, uh, write everything down as as we speak, assuming they're not sleeping. So roll and write, uh, no interaction roll and write, same question that I had before. Um, do you think a no interaction roll and write would work with a castle theme, building a castle theme? Um, and that's, that's my question. Totally works here, yeah. Um, so you see how once again, these, uh, uh, all we have is just a one word theme and uh, we're seeing like a whole genre of game mechanism that this fits neatly into. Now, I I'm, I'm not telling you to make cookie cutter games. I'm not telling you to make exactly the same game that everybody else is making. Um, all I'm showing is if there's going to be uh, design battles that you're going to fight, you're going to want to pick them. You don't want to blunder into them. You don't want to back into them. You don't want to spend a year on your pirate auction game before you realize that the auction just isn't really working and hasn't been working for the last six months. You want to go into it saying, I'm going to make a pirate auction game. The auction is going to be tricky, but I think I know how I can make it work. You know, so, um, or I'm going to make a roll and write about pirates, but I think I know how I can pull it off. Uh, that's what I'm trying to get you, to, that's what I want the takeaway for this talk to be is I want it to be uh, about like knowing what your battles are before you even fight them. 
um, and knowing what the harder parts of the game to design are. So when you get into them, when you start playtesting those, you're knowing exactly what to look for. And that can save, I'm not kidding, months or years off your design time uh, if you know the battles you need to pick instead of uh, just sort of um, um, bouncing about in space like a Roomba, which was my uh, design style for at least a decade, just sort of blindly going bam and then bam and then bam into all these uh, obstacles. All right, so that is my first step. Let's go to my second one. Um, understand the promise that your game's theme makes and align the game's experience to it, okay? Here's what I mean by that. Um, we're going to go for another hypothetical example. Let's say we have a game about baking cakes. Now, cakes have baking points. So you roll dice for each of the cakes you're baking, subtract that number of baking points. When you get to zero or lower, the cake is baked. So I have a cake with... Uh, five baking points, I roll a d6, I get a three, the cake now has two baking points. Next turn, I roll the die again, I get a, I get a two, the cake is baked to perfection, okay? So, great, wonderful, right? But um, I take to my play testers, um, you beat those dirty pies, yes. Um, so, let's say we play tested the, this game, and our play testers say, eh, it's just not that intriguing, I want a little more for it. So, you have an idea. You have a really good idea that you're going to try to implement the game. Now the cakes are closing on you from all sides, and you have baking points. And the cakes can roll dice against you, and if you get to zero baking points, you get baked. And that is how your baking game is now. Well, what you have here is no longer a baking game. It is now a fighting game. And if baking points are just an alternative term for hit points, then... Make it a fighting game. Like, drop the baking theme. Doesn't matter if that was your original idea for the game. Uh, maybe you want to keep the theme and fork it and start making a different game that with hopefully uh, mechanisms that better support a baking theme. But if you want to continue down this road, you've got to make it a fighting game. A fighting game. So, um, uh, so uh, make it a fighting game because it's going to make your experience stronger. Um, so here's a design exercise that I like to suggest to people. Um, and I want to make it clear, this is a design exercise, and I uh, posted this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, so you may have seen, you may have seen the tweet, it got a little bit of traction. Um, you're making a game, it's just not feeling thematic, it's just not feeling like the players are there. Um, what, what can you do? Uh, what I like to do is, uh, if I haven't already, remove all flavor text from the game. Like, if the cards have flavor text, take it all out, only the title remains. So if you're working on a spaceship game and you have a card that says uh, Space Zebras, with an X, of course, um, don't put the history of the Space Zebras on the card. Just take it out. And then whatever the Space Zebras card does, if it feels like something a Space Zebra would do, then you're in a good place. If it doesn't, try to figure out what a Space Zebra would do and how it would feel in the mechanical context of the game. Let the mechanisms tell the story for your game. Uh, I feel like comic lays down a challenge, prove it wrong, that I find hard to resist. <laughs> um, okay, um, and uh, again, lewd narrative dissonance is not necessarily a bad thing. I want to reiterate that. Uh, if your game is dissonant narratively, um, that could be a good thing, but you've got to work for that. Like, that's something that games like Unspeakable Words or Typing of the Dead do from the start. From the very inception, they're like, here it is, this is what the game's about. And every single thing about this game goes back, like feeds off that bit piece of um, loot and narrative dissonance. Um, a theme is a promise you make to your players about what the game's experience is. I'm going to repeat that because I think that's a really important point. A theme is a promise you make to your players about what the game's experience is. And you're going to notice that your players will take that theme and use that to expect what they're going to have, what experience they're going to get when they sit down and play your game. Make sure you, you, you lean into that, because if it does what it says on the tin, your players are going to be very, very satisfied. Um, uh, and I'm not saying, again, to make a cookie-cutter game. I'm not saying that you have to make exactly the same game that everybody else is making. I'm just saying that this is a guideline you need to keep in mind, because if you go too far afield, your players will not join you. They're not going to go to where you are. Um, so corollary from the previous tip, the more unique the game's theme is, the more players will expect its story to be avatar driven. Okay. Um, 
I used to make games with really weird themes. My very first board game was uh, a game about psychics playing Paper, Scissors, Rock. It was really bad. It was really, really bad. Um, and it had a really weird theme, and the mechanisms were absolute garbage, um, and they did not tie into the theme one bit. Uh, and it, I, I didn't learn from that. I kept on making games with, um, with themes that just did not fit. So it took time for this lesson to sink in. The weirder you make your game's theme, the more your players will expect it to be avatar-driven. Um, here's another example. Uh, I, my second published game is a game called Battle Merchants. Um, and originally, it was uh, it, it, well, the release version of the game was about fantasy arms merchants. But the prototype was about um, selling war robots to warring countries, selling fighting robots. So I would tell players, do you want to play my game about uh, building and selling war robots? And they would say, sure, I'll play your game about war robots. You see, already there's a difference of expectation because they sit down expecting lasers and bombs and things like that, and they get what's effectively a spreadsheet game. Not a bad game, you know, the game, they enjoyed the game in the end, but there was that cognitive dissonance at the start, that looted narrative dissonance that they had to take work to get over. You want to avoid that work unless doing that work is the point of the game. Um, you want to make sure that their, their approach to the experience that you want is as frictionless as possible. And again, if the point is loot and narrative dissonance, then make sure that you're leading into it. But if they're fighting it, if they're like, oh, wait, I was expecting one thing and I'm getting another, that's rarely a good sign for your game. Rarely. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about MDA theory, uh, MDA framework. Uh, this is a, a, a framework that uh, a few people came up with, Robin... Um, Hunnicky, I think is, is their name is, uh, Mark LeBlanc and Robert Zubek. Uh, and this is uh, a framework uh, that talks about a game's mechanisms, dynamics, and aesthetics. So the idea is the what we colloquially refer to as the theme could also be story, narrative. Those words are all tied together in a really complex way uh, that I, we're not really, um, not really, uh, I can't really go down that path right now, but just know that theme, story, and uh, narrative are three different things that a lot of people use the word theme for. Um, so uh, that another word for that is the aesthetics. It could also be the art for the game, uh, the look of the game, uh, the UI for the game. That's all aesthetics. Um, on the other side, you've got mechanisms, which are the actual crunchy things that players uh, use not the physical components, but like your auction system, your scoring system, things like that. Um, and then you've got dynamics, which are the guts between the two. They're the connective tissue between the mechanisms and the aesthetics. And I think one of the really important takeaways from the MDA framework is that the player will always look at it from the aesthetics down to the mechanisms. And the designer is always going to be looking up from the mechanisms up through to the aesthetics. If you remember the talk from the, how I started the talk with the tic-tac-toe game, we were looking at from the mechanisms up to the aesthetics. We were looking at it at, uh, we're, we'll use an X to represent space zebras with an X because that's thematic. Um, and that's like a good example of seeing things from the mechanism up. The player's not going to see it that way. The player's going to see it from the aesthetics down and they're going to see an X and they're going to say, why is there an X? Oh, it's X for zebra? And it doesn't really connect the way it does for us. Uh, so, as a designer, it's really hard to switch that perspective uh, and look at it from a player's perspective. But if you can make that switch, if you can learn to make that switch, it takes a while to, to get that knack. And that's really super valuable for you to do. Just knowing that there's two different perspectives, I think that knowledge alone, I think, is really incredibly valuable. And once you start doing this, once you start looking at it, that's where you get really into the art of making board games. Like, that's where some people just have this thing where they can just make this connection and it just hums and it sings. Uh, and it really is an amazing skill when people are good at it. Um, and I think another effect of this is you look at a game like Dominion. Um, I'm going to use Dominion and as, a, as an example of a dry Euro, okay? Because there's like the barest hint of an avatar. Like, technically, you're building up your, uh, your, your kingdom, but, I mean, it's so thin. Um, and it's so thin to the point that even the designer makes fun of it 
on their own box blurbs on the back of the box. If you ever read any of the Dominion box blurbs, they're hilarious because Donald, Donald X. Vaccarino clearly does not care about the story of the game. Like, that's actually important to him, that the story of the game, the avatar level of the game, is just not important in Dominion. And Dominion is a wildly successful, fantastically influential game. This is not a scrub game. This is an amazing game that has had repercussions throughout the industry and still does to this day. So uh, Dominion is a really good example of this. Like when I say a game has a weak avatar story, that's not like a pejorative thing I'm saying. All I'm doing is I'm saying something descriptive and describing something about the game. Dominion is a fantastic game. And I'm going to take it to the next level. I think one of the reasons why the game was so successful is because its avatar part was was not strong, was not a focus. I think if it had been an avatar-led game uh, where it was trying to tell this wild story, I think it would have had a tougher road to climb. Imagine if Ascension had come out before Dominion, because Ascension does have this weird and wild story. Um, where it's it's the sort of interdimensional fight, and there's all these monsters that reappear, and all these characters that reappear in different expansion sets. And you see them, and you know that there's some story that's attached to them. If that had come out before Dominion, I don't think it would have done as well. I seriously don't. I think because Dominion had a really, I'm going to use the word weak, but that's not pejorative, a relatively weak agent, a relatively weak narrative story, that told players, don't worry about this part. This is not the important part of the game. What's important is this, the agent of the game. Um, and if you remember, the first time we played Dominion, like I'll say the first time I played Dominion, I was almost lost. Like, wait a second. Okay, to buy a card, I discard cards out of my hand, but then uh, and into my discard pile. Okay? So cards I spend go into my discard pile. That's fine. But then the card I buy goes into my discard pile, and then the rest of my hand goes into my discard pile? That's weird. Like, that was just the strange thing that I hadn't seen in gaming before, and it took a few rounds for that to stick. If I was trying to juggle that sort of dissonance along with a story-based dissonance, that would have made this game a very hard lift to learn. But the fact that they very wisely did not emphasize the story in this game, they emphasized the agent of this game instead, uh, because that's really where the meat of the game is, I think the game was was successful because of that. And that opened the door to games like Ascension, because by the time you got into Ascension, this was a familiar mechanic to a lot of players. By the time they got to Ascension, they're like, oh, okay, so it's a deck builder, but instead of there being a fixed set of cards to buy, there's a different row of cards, and we have two different currencies. Otherwise, there's a lot of similar, and you can buy as many cards as you want. Otherwise, it's a lot of similarities to Dominion. Got it. They got to use Dominion as a starting point. Um... Uh, yeah, first-generation games with new mechanisms tend to be very dry for this reason, because they want to keep the focus on the mechanism. And I think that's a smart thing to do. Um, I think it's really hard to um, to focus on a story and a mechanism when they're both competing for a player's uh, attention. Now, uh, Ryan is asks, does that make theme an obstacle to acceptance of novel mechanisms? Um I'm going to use, instead of theme, I'm going to say avatar story, like a narrative or a story that you're trying to pay attention to for the avatar. Um, if you're trying to emphasize that along with a novel mechanism, again, you're swimming upstream. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm saying it's going to limit your game's audience. It's going to make, a, make it a harder game to learn. It's going to bounce off of new players because they're not going to be able to juggle so many things. When I say new players, I mean players new to the hobby. Players who are more familiar with the hobby might have an easier time of it, but some of them, it's going to bounce off of them also. So it's going to be tricky. Um, so th there's nothing in this talk where I'm saying you can't or shouldn't do things. I'm saying if you do them, be aware of the road ahead. Okay? Um, uh, is there a total novelty that a game can have? Uh, Jeff Engelstein says that um, when he puts in a new mechanism to a game, he tries to limit a game to, like, one new thing. If he puts two new things in a game, players are already going to get confused. But you put one new thing in a game, you could make the whole focus of the game about that. Um, so uh, a question about... Uh, though this is a board game focused, uh, but theme-first mechanism design useful and explanatory design considerations that go into modern indie TTRPGs. I think so, and I think there's a skill for that. I think the difference is um, 
TTRPG mechanisms tend to be far more avatar driven because they tend to relate right back to the avatar. If you think of it as like a highway, um, you know, those mechanisms are going to have an exit ramp that takes you to Avatar Street. Whereas with a board game, those exit ramps take you to, to Agent Street. And that's important because the experience of a TTRPG is, do I get to do the thing? Do I get to tell an interesting story? Is what's going on really fun and interesting and entertaining? Whereas with a board game, a lot of times the questions are, if I do this, will it, will it let me win? Will it help me win? Will it improve my score relative to the other players? Those are both valid ways to approach game design, but they're very different design mindsets. Uh, which is why I'm sort of tailoring this topic to board games, because once you take a look at it from the RPG point of view, I think a lot of things change. Um, and I would love a more seasoned RPG designer to pick this up and continue to talk about it. Um, we, we have 15 minutes left, so I want to get through the rest of my talk. But uh, the important thing is um, uh, when it talk comes to a dry avatar, if you look at abstract games, they have no avatar at all. But you notice the rules for abstract games are dirt simple. Like, they could fit in, like, three or four paragraphs, and you're off, you know. Maybe, you know, chess has en passant, and Go has rules that, like, while they fit on a sheet of paper, uh, you're not going to get the flow of them, and you're not going to get the heuristics in your first, second, or even third game. Um, but the rules themselves are fairly simple. Um, and we can't get away with designing a game, of chess or, a game like Chess or Go nowadays. The bar is higher. We, we can't quite do that. Uh, so it's okay to have a game with a minimal avatar, so long as your theme promises that, your players are going to thank you. Okay, tip number four, because i got to go super quick. Um, be aware of the story that your players will tell with your game. So let's say if you, game, you have a game with resources that can be stolen from other players. You're going to tell a story there. Your game is going to tell a story. But it's going to tell three different stories based on which uh, part of the player and three persons we're going to focus on. So first... Uh, looking at the agent point of view, agent A gains one resource X, agent B loses one resource X. And that's all stealing is from the agential point of view. It's just this transaction, a zero-sum transaction. That's all it is. But from the avatar point, avatar point of view, the story is different. The avatar is, my thief slipped into your hut in the middle of the night and stole one wood. Uh, that is the avatar telling a story of a stolen resource. And for a player, it's like that, you know? Uh, Joe, you are such a jerk. So um, those are three different stories of a soul, soul and resource. Um, and the tricky thing about these three stories is your players are generally going to focus on one of these stories. So you're going to have to pick which story you want your players to really focus on. I don't think you can have all three. If you can get even two, you're lucky. So um, focus on one of these stories and make that story resonate. And if you're trying to make a narrative-heavy game, uh, like an avatar-heavy game, and players are focused on the agent, you may want to ditch the narrative stuff and focus on the agent instead, because that's what players are lashing onto. Or, if you really want to focus on the narrative stuff, then you can sand down the agent stuff and make it focus more on the avatar stuff. So, uh, that's all stuff. So, here's an example. Um, this is uh, a backstory for a character called Bastion from Overwatch. Um, and it goes a little bit like this. Originally created for peacekeeping purposes, Bastion robot units possess the unique ability to rapidly reconfigure themselves into assault cannon mode. But during the Omnic crisis, they were turned against the human makers, forming the bulk of the Omnic's rebel army. Following the resolution of the crisis, nearly all of them were destroyed or disassembled. To this day, Bastion units still symbolize the horrors of the conflict. That is an agential part of a way to tell the story of Overwatch. That's also a part of the story of Overwatch nobody really pays attention to. This is something that people pay attention to. This is a summary of the fourth batch of the 2019 Overwatch League Grand Finals. With a shock at match point, Vancouver chose to take the match to escort match watch point Gibraltar. The shock once again subbed out Sinatra and Stryker for Rascal and Architect. Defending first, Vancouver overcame the Bastion Mel composition run by San Francisco in the first team fight right at the beginning of the map. However, the shock struck back by winning the following team fight with 220 remaining. That story is more popular. That story resonates with millions of people. Like, millions of people tune in just to watch that story. Uh, so that's an example of knowing what your story is and uh, what, how, what kind of story is resonating with your players. So keep an eye on which story resonates the most. Okay, we're blasting through these tips.
Uh, tip number five, each thematic layer should be represented mechanically. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones because new game designers get this wrong all the time. I got it wrong all the time at first. So uh, let's say that you are making a game about dog lawyers. I've brought this up on this specific example on Ludology before. So from, a, from an agential point of view, I'm sorry, from an avatar point of view, the game must feel like it has dogs. It must feel like it has lawyers, and the dogs are also lawyers, and the lawyers are also dogs. So if the game only feels like it's about lawyers and not dogs, and it, or if it only feels like it's about dogs and not lawyers, the theme will not feel well integrated. You will have unintended looted narrative dissonance. So you've got to do lawyer things in court, like you've got to cross-examine witnesses and shout objection dramatically. But maybe you have to go out every often to do your business, or maybe the opposing dog lawyer can distract you with a squirrel. Or maybe the witness starts howling on the stand, so both dog lawyers must pass a check or howl as well. That's the kind of thing you need to do to pull off a game about dog lawyers. Before we had an example of, um, of uh, pirate insurance adjusters. And I think that example, I want to come back to it for this very thing. If you're going to do that, it's got to feel like it's about insurance adjusters, but it's also got to feel like it's about pirates. And huh, there's a video game, uh, Return of the Orbit did, that comes where it's not necessarily about pirates it's more about a mutiny but it's definitely about insurance adjusting the results of mutiny um okay getting close to the end um tip number six uh a game with a uh, complex agency will generally need high thematic stakes um uh, it's not a hard and fast rule but it's easy to screw up so um the lower the stakes in your game the lower your game's complexity budget is going to be let me, uh, let me explain complexity budget first. Uh, this is a term that Richard Garfield popularized. I don't believe uh, he actually came up with it, but he also po but he did popularize it. Um, he says there's uh, one thing that comes up often is that there's a mechanic I, they really like, and I think it's too complicated. On its own, it may not itself seem complicated, but he explains that game designs have a complexity budget. You only have a certain amount of complexity, and you, you have to figure out whether it's worth spending. Um, so let me give an example of that. Um, uh, now, uh, we're going to go back to the chat again. Uh, we're going to use game length as a rough analog of complexity, um, but it's not obviously not an exact join. Uh, so let's say we have a game about making milkshakes. What game length feels right to you? 20 minutes or two, two or more hours? Which feels right for a game about making milkshakes? And I want you to respond in the chat. Um, and again, um, I'm using um, game length as an analog for complexity, but that's not always a, 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 an a good example. But in this case, we're going to use it just as a fast to lose thing. Everybody's saying A, I agree. Um, I'm not saying you can't make a two-hour game about making milkshakes, but I'm saying if you do, you are sailing into the wind, you're going uphill, it is going to be tough. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, a game about the entire arc of human evolution. Which game length feels right to you? 20 minutes or two plus hours? And again, I want you to reply in the chat um, about uh, a game about the entire arc of human evolution. Do you think that would work with two minutes or would work better with two hours? Uh, and let's see what, what folks think. So I'm seeing a B, B. Yeah, uh, I'm seeing a lot of Bs. Um, and again, this isn't a hard and fast rule. I'm not saying you can't make a 20-minute game about human evolution, about the entire arc of human evolution, but it's not going to feel like the entire arc of human evolution because it's going to be very quick. Uh, and it won't give you that epic feel that the entire arc of human evolution, that sentence promises epicness, and a 20-minute game just doesn't feel epic. Um, human evolution has a higher complexity budget. It's going to have that game's going to have much more complex rules. It's going to be a longer rules teach than a game about milkshakes. Obviously, I'm generalizing here, but this is what players are going to bring into your game. Um, and this is my final tip. So we're get, making it just under the wire, Andy. Um, be careful about overtaxing your players by forcing them to handle dense avatars and agents. Your players have only so much cognitive ability. So your players are always keeping track of the three levels of your game, even though they are focusing on one as the story that they're going to take away. So you need to make sure that they're not overwhelming each other. So if your game has enormous complexity from an agential point of view, like a, like a Lacerda game, a lot of rules, then you need to, need to be careful about how much emergent narrative you want to bring out at the avatar level. If all of their focus 
is going to be on the agent, leave some, you want to leave some room and make sure there's not too much that you're taxing them on the avatar level. But if, on the other hand, you want tons of emergent narrative in your game, and the mechanisms of your game are too complex, your game's gonna, your player's going to be too busy adjudicating the rules to really focus on the narrative. Now, games like Mage Knight or Kingdom Death Monster get away with it by focusing on emergent complexity. They have simple systems that intertwine, not a few big systems, and a very familiar theme that doesn't take much effort to get into. Now, if you have a game with a really spectacular agent and a really spectacular avatar, and they're not connected well enough, and it's tough to connect two of them if they're both spectacular, you're going to get Monkeys on the Moon. A good game, but a weird game. And a game that just didn't really um, catch on. So those are my seven tips of uh, integrating theme and mechanism. We have now reached the end. I want to remind you uh, that the things that I told you, none of them are hard and fast rules. Each of them is a rule that is begging to be broken. However, you got to know that you're breaking a rule. You got to know what you're doing and know that, all right, if I do it this way, there's going to be like some dissonance. There's going to be some pushback. There's going to be some confused players. So how do I work around that? How do I make the player's experience as smooth as possible? Now, if I give them a twist, it's a twist I want them to have. So uh, that is uh, our talk today. Uh, looks like we have three minutes for questions. Uh, I hope we can get like at least one question in. Um, yeah, and Ryan, I agree. It's good to start with making the rules to know how to break them later. Um, I mean, that's a really, really big part of doing any kind of craft. If uh, There's a bit from the making of Apocalypse Now, the documentary Hearts of Darkness, where Francis Ford Coppola and Dennis Hopper are arguing on set about if it's possible to forget your lines if you never learned them in, your in the first place. Uh, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm with Francis Ford Coppola. In order to forget your lines, you have to have learned them in the first place. You can't forget your lines if you didn't learn them. Then you just don't know your lines. Uh, Melissa, it is so awesome to hear from you, even if you're just detached text on a screen. Uh, it's just fantastic to hear from you. Uh, Ryan, again, always a pleasure. Um, all of you uh, who took the time to hang out in the chat, thank you for spending time with me. Um, I hope you got a, lot out, got a lot out of this talk. Uh, it was several years in the making, learning all of these things, and I hope this helps you as a designer avoid the pitfalls that I always find you. Um, so online, you can find me uh, at Gilhova. Uh, that's on there. They can uh, on the slide um, at Gilhova on Twitter, uh, at Gilhova on Instagram. Although I never post there because I'm not really a visual person. Um, Formal Ferret Games on Facebook, FormalFerretGames.com. Um, and if you go to Ludology.net, you'll hear more deep dives about game design, um, uh, much like this. Uh, oh my gosh, Drashel, thank you so much. Three pages of notes. Uh, I, I, I'm really glad you got a lot of this talk. Uh, um, Canary, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, and uh, I will see you all around. Andy, you can take us away. Uh, thank you all again. I'm going to keep on saying thank you until Andy cuts us off. <laughs>